Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Fridays with Fawn. My name is Fawn Lopez, your host. I'm publisher of Modern Healthcare and vice president at Crane Communications. Joining me today is Bryani Nguyen, SVP and chief strategy officer for Anthem. In her role, Bryani is responsible for accelerating enterprise strategy for sustained growth for the 23rd largest company on the Fortune 500. Welcome, and thank you for joining me. Fawn, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. So I'd like to start with, um, for the audience to learn a little bit about you. Can you walk us through your career journey, which started in Zimbabwe and took you around the world, ending up in Indianapolis, where you play a major role in guiding Anthem's strategy? Absolutely, I, I'd be thrilled to. Um, and Fawn, for anyone who doesn't know where Harare, Zimbabwe is, don't feel bad. I didn't know where Indiana was until uh, <laughs> fairly recently. Um, but Zimbabwe's in South, Southern Africa. It's uh, the country above South Africa. And I was born there. Um, and my family are all Zimbabwean. My mom and dad were both born there as well. And my grandparents were born in, in South Africa. And so we have a long history of being, of being Southern African. Um, and to be honest, it's really shaped very much my view of the world, as you might imagine, but also my interest in health. Uh, growing up in the developing world, you realize how pivotal health is to being able to thrive uh, as a human being. And the links with uh, the economy and your ability to work, um, with the ability to go to school and to learn and what you do is so intricately uh, interlinked with your own health and that of your parents and your family, um, that I always knew that I wanted to do something in this area. Uh, you. Yeah, traveled around a bit, went to South Africa and did my um, undergrad there. Um, did my postgrad in the UK and uh, ended up working for McKinsey and Company as a consultant uh, after after school. And really, I just wanted to learn, you know, broadly um, about business um, and how to drive impact, how to solve problems. And consulting is a is a great place for uh, people who don't know what they want to do when they grow up. Um, and it was that way for me. And I ended up staying sort of ten years until I was a partner. Um, worked uh, across uh, the NHS, healthcare in, um, in the UK, did pharma work and health systems work in Europe um, and in a, a set of African governments as well, and ended up coming to the US um, about 10 years ago when uh, I actually followed my husband. We're part, I'm part of a dual career couple and followed him. He did his, uni his MBA at the University of Chicago. And so um, we came here at a time when um, the Affordable Care Act was the big transformation in, in US healthcare. And I laugh, but it's only, uh, you know, partly, it's, I laugh, but it's, it's pretty true that um, many business leaders took it better from a foreign accent than from an American that the ACA was a business opportunity and you should choose to play or not play, but do it for business reasons, not political ones. That's great. So, um, so you talked a bit about what sparked your interest in uh, in in, in health to get into healthcare, and you talked a bit about um, your time at McKinsey and Company, mm -hmm. one of the youngest executives at Anthem, which wow. is the nation's second largest insurer, uh, health insurer. So, can you talk to us? How, how did you advance to becoming one of the youngest? Uh, executives at this giant uh, insurer, health insurer? Um, you know, Fawn, it's a good question. And um, it's very cool. And I've, I've had a lot of luck um, and a lot of hard work, uh, uh, you know, across my career. And I, I think that's true of um, many people who, you know, who do really well. But I think at the root of it is just uh, a personal purpose. Um, I feel very inspired by the privilege of being able to work on behalf of uh, people in some of the toughest times in their lives when they or a loved one is sick. And it just gives me 
uh, you know, a lot of passion. I've also been blessed to collaborate with some incredible people. I uh, worked at Blue Cross North Carolina previously to Anthem with um, Patrick Conway and Rahul Rajkumar, who are uh, now at Optum. Um, and they're incredible thought leaders uh, in the space. And I, um, you know, my belief is when you do well, it's always because you're part of a team. And I've just been lucky to have some incredible teams along the way. Good for you. Good for you. Congratulations. Um, so the the um, talked a bit about you know what you have been doing, um, been able to do at Anthem. You were a driving force behind the inclusion of public health, community health, and for Anthem to address social determinants of health. Um, so you you you've been um, you were a driving force in 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 putting social determinants of health into the core business of uh, strategy at Anthem. Tell us a little more about what Anthem is doing to addressing social determinants of health and how have you been able to integrate your passion for public health to influence the culture at Anthem? Yeah, it's a very good question. And I, uh, you know, let's start with the fact that there is a strong culture of public health across the whole blue system. And Anthem is, is no different. I mean, the Blues plans um, from their inception have been based in the communities where associates live and work. And then, you know, with the CEO, Gail Boudreau, is very publicly committed to advancing uh, uh, community health sustainably as well. So I'll start with saying I, you know, I, enjoy, I joined a group of people where this was already um, a real priority. And part of the strategy was just how to make it real. How could we have impact? Um, when I, uh, when I chat to people about what strategy is and social determinants is no different, I see it as a set of tangible steps that we take every day to achieve what your ultimate purpose is. And at Anthem, that's improving the health of humanity. And that is a uh, North Star for us. So when I think about social determinant strategy, it's what are the tangible things we can do every day to do that? Um, and so a couple of things. The first thing is, you know, let's make it visible. Um, it, as part of our strategy, I would love a day where we don't need to talk about social drivers when we talk about health, because it's so embedded in our psyche, just like this, the way you don't talk about contracting with hospitals when you mm -hmm. talk about health, because it's so uh, core to what you do. I think social drivers need to be the same. And so keeping it front and center of what health means was a good start. And that was in our strategic framework. The second uh, point is really working with where do you have influence and can you know affect change and there's three sort of concentric circles i would say when we think about it at anthem the first is in our house account with our own employees or associates you know what are the social drivers impact we can have um, with that group of people where we are both their insurer but also their employer and provide the coverage the second is within our members. And then the third is communities at large. Mm -hmm. And um, a bit of the work is to say, OK, so what tactically can we do across those three buckets? Um, give you some examples. We have redesigned our benefits plan for our employees to include social drivers benefits. Uh, we call them life essential kits. This is the first year and we're testing the impact. But let me tell you that the uptake has been terrific. Um, oh. And it's you know things like transportation, it's access to healthy food benefits, um, even some childcare. And we're testing the exact benefits and, and who they apply to. Um, but it's really nice to innovate in that way. That's uh, great. Go ahead, please. And then, um, and then I would say, you know, COVID has illuminated, and you know, we should talk about this a bit more. Some of the disparities across our country. I don't think it's created them. It's it's certainly illuminated them. And then thinking about what we could do immediately to, uh, you know, to help on social drivers there, and that was part of Anthem's big partnership with Lyft, which was, regardless of whether you are a member or not, how can we help get access uh, to vaccinations? Good for you. So, so what what kind of of, of experience? What 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 were the the results that you've experienced through that through that partnership? Yeah. So, I, I think a couple of things. One is um, really be understanding who requires what social 
driver to, or, you know, or social benefit that will really make a difference. In the Lyft partnership, uh, for example, we got many people access to vaccinations, but we learned very quickly that that was not the only blocker. You know, this is a really uh, difficult web of idea systems and beliefs, trust in the system, access um, more broadly than just transportation, and then clearly transportation as well. So um, I think one of the things we experienced was this is wonderful, and it's good that we're making steps in the right direction. But at the same time, social health, or social drivers of health, like other aspects of health, health are incredibly nuanced and complicated. And it's a much more holistic approach we need to take. So what what are some of the future um, uh, projects that you might be working on that you might be able to share with us? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, you know, for, for broadly, um, I'm quite excited about making social drivers not a project in and of itself, but really embedded into absolutely everything we do. Good point. So let me you know, show some specifics. When we're thinking about maternal health strategy, and we've been working on the Momnibus bill, for example, um, with Representative Lauren Underwood, um, and then broadly across Anthem, you know, we think about what access to medical care do our moms need, but also what access to social drivers and care do moms need. And thinking about both of those simultaneously and not in a disjointed way, we think is going to be really powerful. And, Absolutely. you know, when we talk about whole health and even when we talk about whole health across the system, company agnostic, it's really important to see social as part of that. You know, there's clinical, there's pharmacy, uh, behavioral health now is much more accepted as part of health and social drivers is, is the fourth you know, quadrant of that. I was going to ask you about uh, behavioral health, health and mental health. Yeah. So. Share with share with us your thoughts on that and 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 what is Anthem doing? Yeah, to addressing that that very important critical area of health. Yeah, and you know, I think there is no time uh, that is better than today to have this conversation because yeah. when I talk about the impact that COVID has had on people across the country, uh, being able to talk about mental health might be one of the few positives that has come out of that. Um, you know, you're sitting in my home at the moment, uh, having this conversation. And I think what we've done over the last, you know, 18 months has really been beamed into people's lives yeah. in a very different way. I've seen homes and bedrooms and dining rooms and kids and dogs, and it's got much more personal. And I think because of that, we can now talk about mental health in a slightly different way. You know, I'm struggling today. I, it's hard to go out. I'm lonely. Um, all of these things might have been more difficult to speak about a year ago. And one that is such a great point. Yeah, you know what I I really haven't thought about. Um, one in five Americans has a behavioral health condition or episode every year. Mm -hmm. um, and if you had a cough or sneezed, I'd be able to say, "Hey, Fawn, how are you feeling today? Yeah. You didn't look so great yesterday." So much harder with behavioral health conditions, yeah. and yet you're know, very prevalent. Twenty percent of the population. Um, and so to get, you know, to answer your question directly, I think that is how Anthem's approaching this is very much as a health condition and integrated into whole health, like, um, all of the other aspects of health we talk about. Um, as you know, we bought Beacon mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, and this was really a, um, affirmation of how important we think behavioral health on the mental health sides and the substance use side, how important it is to be integrated into you know health benefits and insurance so so important and thank you thank you for your work on that it's it's just uh we're going to be talking about mental health uh, a lot more in moving forward so for organizations insurers like anthem to to step up in this area is just such an important um step in in the right direction so thank right. you for your work on that um, so we um, we talked a little bit about um, how you uh, were one of the youngest um, uh, executives at Anthem. In 2019, you were named on Modern Healthcare, our own uh, top 25 emerging leaders, and you you um, so the list goes on and on. And what an what a, an impressive accomplishment and and resume. 
So I'd love to know, what did you do that you feel really prepared you for that, um, for this? And what advice, more importantly, uh, do you have for young uh, women who are preparing for the next phase in their career into an executive position? Fawn, well, that's a great question. And let me tell you, I'm the eldest of five and my siblings will tell you I've been telling them what to do their whole lives. <laughs> and that's probably what prepared me for any of this type of leadership. Um, but in seriousness, you know, my, my advice for people is fairly, is fairly simple. The first is be really honest with yourself about what you want to do and what trade-offs are going to be required to get there. You know, what gives you passion? Uh, where do you see yourself? Achievement comes in many forms. Um, and I think it's very important that we both recognize and celebrate that. You know, my mom chose not to work um, outside the home while I was young, and I have benefited incredibly from that. And she's an incredibly successful human being who is living her passion and purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that we tell everybody, particularly women, let's start with that. What gives you joy? What gives you energy? And what impact do you want to have? Um, the second thing I would say is, uh, you, you know, you have to work really hard. And that is just totally okay to both say and admit. And things that you do should be great. Uh, you know, the quality needs to be high of anything that you put your name on or, um, uh, you know, a product, whether it's an Excel model or a PowerPoint template or clinical program design or an entire enterprise strategy. Let's start with a commitment to get this right. Um, and finally, and I think this is super important, is just a huge amount of uh, both humility, but also excitement at what we get to do every day, particularly in health. Um, it is a real privilege to be able to work on things that impact people's lives. And that is so much more important. And the minute we do that, success will come. Like this is a very complicated industry uh, where, you know, we need leaders many more than we have, particularly leaders who have a diversity of experiences and backgrounds. Um, that the minute you start doing things that are great that impact people's lives, success will come. Such a great advice. And I've, we talked about this a lot. Um, I, I talk about this a lot with my colleagues is, is that, you know, it takes hard work and, and there's no doubt about it. There's no easy way to, yeah. to get there unless you put in the effort and the hard work, but be proud of what you do and work really hard and, and, to, to make sure, to ensure that your work is high quality and that something you can be proud of. So exactly. great, great advice. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that you are also one of the 127 people in the world named to the Forum of Young Global Leaders by the World Economic Forum. So what, what an amazing accomplishment there. Thank you so much. I love the World Economic Forum and I love the impact that they do. They have um, the organization connects private and public sector and social sector leaders across the globe, which is really important to me because one of the things that I feel very acutely, at least in American healthcare, is there is this debate about are we a public system or a private system? And you know, Fawn, it's a bit of a joke because we're a hybrid system. The yeah. government pays for a lot of healthcare in this country and clearly regulates. And the private sector delivers services, um, uh, you, you know, across the country as well. Um, and I think it's really important we see this more as a collaboration and how do we work together to advance health in the US than having the debate about public or private. So I think the World Economic Forum does that really nicely. And it also keeps me connected to my more global roots. Of course, and it's so wonderful to hear from someone who has such a global perspective like yourself. So thank you for making that point. Really appreciate that. The past 18 months have been uh, extremely difficult for all of us. What have you learned about yourself and as a leader as you help your team navigate the challenges brought on by the pandemic? You know, Fawn, it's a great question. Um, and my personal uh, leadership philosophy or tendencies lends itself more to openness than professionalism, whatever that's supposed to mean. And that's been a real uh, lesson for me during this pandemic personally, is that's very important when people are struggling. And it's important to acknowledge when you're struggling. 
Um, I have three little kids. Uh, my kids are six, four, and eighteen months. Wow. Um, I, uh, as I've said, I you know my husband uh, works in business as well, um, and we moved to Indiana during the pandemic. And so there has been a lot on. And I think uh, being able to discuss that and discuss that with my team um, has been incredibly important. Um, I got an email the other day that had a really great signature that has resonated with me. And it said, uh, I sent this email at a time that was convenient for me. Please respond at a time that's convenient for you. And that's my biggest learning of the pandemic. We work around talented, hardworking, committed people, and they should be able to do that on their own time and a time that suits them. And we as leaders need to really trust that that's going to happen. Good for you. That is, uh, uh, that's wonderful. And essentially what you said was that authentic authenticity is so important, right? We have to show the human side of, of, of ourselves. That's exactly. uh, we can wear that business hat all day long, but at the end of the day, we're still people. Right. And, yeah, and exactly. we want to be treated as people. Yep. Good for okay. you. Good for you. Love hearing that. So you talked a bit about your your children and uh, and your spa, your husband being part of a dual, dual career family. With children, how do you find balance if you can? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. I, you know, part of it is a recognition that you probably have to redefine balance. Um, but it all goes back to, you know, do what gives you joy. Yeah. Um, and that is the way I think about my family life and my professional life. And I don't try and stick to any particular rules or norms. It's not I will work between this hour and that hour. It's um, I will take advantage of the time to get things done when I have it. So I, you know, I'm very excited. My little girl, my six-year-olds did a whole bunch of swim galas this summer. And I made it to every single one. And that sometimes meant I had to work in the evenings or, you know, after they'd gone to bed. Um, and I'm very comfortable with that. And, it, you know, it's, it sounds very basic. But I think sometimes balance comes down to that. You know, give yourself the license to fit your work around your life and your life around your work. That's great advice. And you have, what, three children, two girls and a boy? That's right. Girl, boy, yeah. girl. Oh, how nice. Good for you. And, and you know, you're one of five children. I'm one of six. Right. So so love having siblings. Right. So they're lucky to right. have to have uh, each other. So that's wonderful. Um, so let's talk about your passion for equality. Um, you were recently appointed to the board of directors uh, for Unified Women's Healthcare which is a leading practice management uh, platform in women's health. Can you talk to us a bit about your perspective uh, when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? What would be the value of long-term investments in a diversity strategy that focuses on continuous learn enhancing inclusiveness within an organization? Well, and that's a great question. And I'll start with the fact, the facts here are clear. Uh, you know, McKinsey and a whole bunch of organizations have done so much research that say outcomes are better when driven by diverse teams. And um, in almost every industry, and regardless of what outcome you're talking about, whether it's um, total return to shareholders or profit on the financial side, or if it's um, better outcomes in hospitals or clinical outcomes, diverse teams deliver better. And so for me, the business case is, is very clear on this. I think even more importantly, though, the human case for me uh, it should not even be up for discussion. If you really want to improve the health of humanity or um, you know, do things better for humanity as a whole, of course you should take into account more than 50% of humanity. Um, and that's just on a gender perspective. Like, it seems crazy to me that this is even a debate for us anymore. And then um, in healthcare in particular, uh, the outcomes we have, particularly for Black Americans, but in general for non-white Americans, are appalling. And there's something that I think is a public health crisis in this country. Racism is a public health crisis in this country. 
And so I believe we have a huge moral imperative um, as leaders across health to fix that now. Couldn't agree more with you. And again, thank you for your passion and your work in this area. We, we appreciate it. We all appreciate it, being a, a, a woman and a woman of color. So thank you. And you know, a great place to start here is in women's health and particularly in the health of moms and babies, which is why I'm very excited about this role with Unified Women's. Um, I think the stats on uh, maternal mortality and other uh, mom and child issues across races has been well documented in the US. So mm -hmm. if we're going to make this really tangible, a great place to start is there. Fantastic. So what do you think about, what do you think is the future for women executives in healthcare, regardless of the sector that they're in? Insurer, uh, provider side or government? Yeah. So I mean, hopefully, hopefully bright. And I think we need to be creating and maintaining, um, you know, even more diverse workplaces where everyone can bring their best selves to work. I do think we have a period of difficulty ahead. And, you know, I talk about pandemics within the pandemic, yeah. which are what are going to be the, you know, longer lasting effects of this pandemic. And one of those is going to be equality in the workforce. We saw a number of women, um, primary caregivers, either of children or of parents, drop out of the workforce during this time um, across every level and across every industry. And that's going to be enduring. Um, and I think we have to be incredibly thoughtful about what the next steps are uh, to be able to bring women back to the workforce and to be able to accelerate um, their careers in some of the areas where they have lost over the last two years. But without specific thought and strategies about this, it's not going to just happen organically. We need to make something happen here. Speaking like a true chief strategy officer. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I watched um, CNN this morning uh, and a nurse um, was talking about the, the stress that she's endured over the last 18 months and she finally is leaving the workforce. So we are, that is another pandemic in and of itself. Uh, the frontline workers, um, folks are leaving the industry. And uh, so we do need to come up with a, a solid strategy uh, as to how we can bring women back into the workforce and how we can help them to, to, to grow and develop. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think care providers um, across the US have been through hell in this pandemic in a way that is unimaginable. Um, and that is another area women or men really that we need to think about incredibly seriously um is you know more than gratitude and respect on twitter how do we show gratitude and respect and real change um it, you know with our care providers in the way and where and how they work absolutely so you talked about um having children and finding balance, working at, later at night uh, after having, you know, the uh, spend time with your, your children. So what do you do to relax, rejuvenate, refresh? In other words, what do you do for fun? I can tell you have a lot of fun with <laughs> your work, but what else do you do for fun? Yeah, I love to run. I run badly, so not very well and not very fast, but I really enjoy it. Um, and so spend a ton of time outside in the summer and then with Peloton on a, on a treadmill in winter in Indiana um, running. Um, and then any kind of outdoor activity with my family. For the first time during COVID, we rented an RV and went camping, all five of us. It's a big deal, yeah. Um, for, for a week and it was so much fun. So I'm hoping to do more of that. That is a big trend. Yeah. All my friends now have RVs. <laughs> They're all driving. It's a fantastic socially distanced holiday. This is absolutely. Cool. That is yeah. so, that's great. Good for you. I uh, still am yet uh, uh, done that. So I, I, I want to experience it one of these days. I'd love to spend more time with you, but unfortunately our time is up. So um, it is been such a pleasure speaking with you. 
And thank you for all that you've shared with, with our audience. Um, one last question, any advice, comment that you'd like to, um, to make uh, to this audience or to the, the healthcare industry in general? Fawn, thank you so much. It's been it's been terrific to spend a Friday with you. Um, yeah, there are there are two things. Uh, one is I'll say uh, nothing is going to change unless we make it. And so I ask everybody who is uh, who's listening to say what did you learn during COVID about how to make our system better, and let's carry that forward and make it happen. And the second is a more simple one, and that's just a big thank you to all the care providers who've done so much on the front lines over the last 18 months and who are continuing to do so now. Thank you for that. It has been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. Thank you for sharing your time and you know, comments and advice with us so generously. I know how busy you are. And um, just we are, I know our audience is, is gonna really uh, get a lot out of this conversation. Fawn, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for watching and thank you for joining us. And uh, also thank you for joining us at our latest uh, Women Leaders in Healthcare Conference. Uh, please mark your calendar for next year's Women Leaders in Healthcare Conference, which will be held on July 14th and 15th in Chicago. As always, I look forward to seeing you on the next Fridays with Fawn. Thank you. Thank you.